Charles I on learning the death of the Duke was that such terrible news might discourage the Rochelle. He endeavored, says Richelieu, in his memoirs to conceal it from them as long as possible, closing all the ports of his kingdom and carefully keeping watch that no vessel should go in and out until the army which Buckingham was getting together had set sail. Stop. 
Of some town or village, 
Armentieres, red parthos, Armentieres, I don't know such a place, and the name of a town or village is written in red, red ethos. Come on then, come on then, said D'Artagnan. Let us keep that paper carefully, perhaps I have not thrown away half my half pistols. Don't worry, my friends, don't worry. Conveyed 
had to risk something in order that she might know how to get out to act afterward, desirous of seeing how, how far the discretion of the good abbess would go. She began to tell a story, obscure at first, but very circumstantial afterward, of the cardinal relating the hours of the minister with Madame d'Aguillon, Marianne de Lorme, and several other women of Calais. The abbess listened more attentively, grew animated by degrees, and smiled. She takes a pleasure in my conversation. If she is a cardinalist, she has no fanaticism in honor or jail. She then went on to describe the persecutions exercised by the cardinal upon his enemies. The abbess only crossed herself without approving or disapproving. This, concern, this confirmed my lady in her opinion that the abbess was rather a royalist than a cardinalist, and my lady therefore contained, continued heightening their narrations more and more. They have very little acquainted with all these matters.
that that she is called so. Yes, madam, do you know her? The lady smiled to herself at the idea which had occurred to her that she that this might be her old waiting maid that was connected with the remembrance of this girl, remembrance of anger and a desire of vengeance disordered the features of my lady, but which, however, immediately recovered the calm and benevolent expression which this woman of a hundred faces had had Adam for a moment allowed them to lose. And when can I see this young lady for whom I already feel so great a sympathy? asked my lady. Why, this evening, said the abbess, and today even, but you have been traveling me. These four days, as you told me, this morning you rose at five o'clock, and you must stand in need of repose, go to bed and sleep, at dinner time we will call you. My lady would very willingly have gone without sleep, sustained as she was by all the excitements that a fresh adventure awakened in her heart. Ever thirsting for intrigues, she nevertheless accepted the offer of the spirit. During the last fifteen days, she had experienced so many and such various emotions that if her frame of iron was still capable of supporting fatigue, her mind required repose. She therefore took leave of the abbess and went to bed, softly rocked by the ideas of vengeance which the name of Kitty had naturally brought back to her thoughts. She remembered that almost unlimited promise which the cardinal had given her if she had succeeded in her enterprise. She had succeeded. D'Artagnan was then in her power. One thing alone frightened her. That was the remembrance of her husband, the Count de la Fere, whom she had thought dead, or at least expatriated, and whom she found again in Athos, the best friend of D'Artagnan. But also, if he was the friend of D'Artagnan, he must have lent him assist in his assistance in all the proceedings by the means of which the Queen had defeated the projects of his eminence. If he was the friend of D'Artagnan, he was the enemy of the Cardinal. She doubtless should succeed in developing in the fields of the vengeance by which she hoped to destroy the young musketeer. All these hopes were so many sweet thoughts from the lady, too. So, rocked by them, she soon fell asleep. She was awakened by a soft voice which sounded at the foot of her bed, and she opened her eyes and saw the abbess accompanied by a young woman. I hair and a delicate complexion fixed upon her. The face of the young woman was entirely unknown to her. Each examined the other with great attention, while exchanging the customary compliments. Both were very handsome, but of quite different styles of beauty. The lady, however, smiled on observing that she excelled the young woman by far in her high hair and aristocratic bearing. It is true that the habit of a novice which the young woman was, was not very advantageous in a contest of this kind. The abbess introduced them to each other, then, when this formality was gone through, as her duties called her to the church, she left the two young women alone. The novice, seeing my lady remain in bed, was about to follow the example of the superior, but my lady stopped her. How, oh, madam, said she, I have scarcely seen you, and you already wish to deprive me of your company, upon which I had reckoned a little. I must confess during the time I have to pass here. Now, madam, replied the novice, only I thought I had chosen my time now. Sleep, you were fatigued. Well, said my lady, what can people who are asleep wish for? A happy awakening. This awakening you have given me. Allow me then to enjoy it at my ease. Taking her hand, she drew her toward the chair by the bedside. The novice sat down. How unfortunate I am, said she. I have been here six months without the shadow of an amusement. You were right, and your presence was likely to afford me delightful company. I expect, according to all probability, Contrary, for which 
which I thank God for it would have cost me very dear to think she had forgotten me. Thank you, madam, you appear to be free, and if you were inclined to fly and only rest with yourself to do so, whither would you have me go? Without friends, without money, in a part of France with which I am unacquainted and where I have never been before. Oh, cried the novice, as to friends, you would have them where you would have them wherever you went. You appear so good and are so beautiful. That does not prevent, replied Milady, softening her smile so as to give it an angelic expression, my being alone or my being persecuted. Hear me, said the novice, we must trust in heaven. There always comes a moment when the good you have done. Plead your cause before God, and see perhaps it is a happiness for you, humble and powerless as I am, that you have met with me more than my name is pleased well. I have my powerful friends who, after having exerted themselves on my account, may also exert themselves for you. Oh, when I said I was alone, said my lady, hoping to make the novices speak of by speaking of herself, it is not for want of some highly pleased friends, but these friends themselves tremble before the cardinal. The queen herself does not dare to oppose the terrible minister. I am praying that her majesty, notwithstanding her excellent heart, has more than once been obliged to abandon persons who had served her to the anger of his eminence. Trust me, madam, the queen may appear to have abandoned those persons, but we must not put faith in appearances. Why they are persecuted, the more she thinks of them, and often when they the least expect it, they receive proofs of a kind of remembrance. Alas, said my lady, I believe so. The queen is so good. Oh, you know her then, that lovely and noble queen, by your speaking of her thus, cried the novice warmly. That is to say, replied my lady, driven into her entrenchments, that I am not the honor of knowing her personally, but I know a great number of her most intimate friends. Madam, 
chapter 62, Two Varieties of Demons. Ah, oh, great Melody and Rochefort, together is that you? Yes, it is. And you come, asked Milady, from La Rochelle, and you from England, Buckingham, dead or desperately wounded, as I left without being able to obtain anything of him. A fanatic has just assassinated him. Ah, said Rochefort with a smile, this is a fortunate chance, one that will delight his eminence. Have you informed him of it? I wrote to him from below. But what brings you here? His eminence was uneasy and sent me to inquire after you. I only arrived yesterday. And what have you been doing since yesterday? I have not lost my time. Oh, I have no fear of that. Do you know whom I have found here? No. Yes. How can I? That young woman whom the queen took out of prison, the mistress of that fellow, D'Artagnan. Yes, Madame Bonachot, with whose retreat the cardinal was unacquainted. Upon my word, said de Rochefort, here is a chance that may be paired with the other. Truly, Monsieur le Cardinal is a privileged man. Imagine my astonishment, continued my lady, when I found myself face to face with this woman. Does she know you? No. Then she looks upon you as a stranger. My lady smiled. I am her best friend. Upon my honor, it is only you countess that can perform such miracles. And if it is well, I can, Chevalier, said Milady. Do you know what is going on here? No. She's about to be taken away tomorrow or the day after with an order from the queen. Indeed. And who is going to do that? D'Artagnan and his friends. They certainly will go so far we shall be obliged to put them into the Bastille at last. Why is it not done already? Because Monsieur Le Cardinal has a weakness with respect to those to these men, which I cannot at all account for. Indeed, yes. Well then, tell them him this, Rochefort. Tell him that our conversation at the Auberge of the Columbia Rouge was overheard by these four men. Tell him that after his departure, one of them came up to me and took from me my by violence the same conduct which he had given me. Tell him they warned Lord de Winter of my passage to England. This time they had nearly made me fall in my mission, as they did in the affair of the studs. Tell him that among these four men, two only are to be feared, D'Artagnan and Ethos. Tell him that the third, Aramis, the lover of Madame de Chevreuse, he may be left alone. We know his secret, it may be useful. As to the fourth, the fourth of he is a fool, a simpleton, a blustering movie, not worth troubling himself about. But these four men must be now at the siege of La Rochelle. I thought so too, but a letter which Madame Bonachot has received from Madame Le Conantable, in which she has the imprudence to show me, leads me to believe that these four men, on the contrary, are on the road hither to take her away. The devil, what's to be done? What did the cardinal say with respect to me? I was to take your dispatches, written or verbal, to return post, and when he shall know what you have done, he will think of what you have to do. I must then remain here, here or in the environs. You cannot take me with you. No, the order is imperative near the camp. You might be recognized in your presence. You must be aware who compromised the cardinal. And I must wait here or in this neighborhood. Only tell me beforehand where you will wait for commands from the cardinal. Let me know always where to find you. But observe, it is probable I may not be able to remain here. Why not? You forget that my enemies may arrive at any minute. That's true. But then is this little woman to escape his eminence? Ah, oh, said my lady with a smile that only belonged to herself. Did I not tell you I was her best friend? Oh, that's true. Likewise, I may then tell the cardinal with respect to this little woman. Then you may be at ease. Is that all? You will know what that means. You will guess at least. Passing through Lily.
Madame Bonachot re 
Commander, she found Milady with a smiling countenance. Well, said the young woman, what do you dread it has happened? This evening or tomorrow, the Cardinal will send someone to take you away. Who told you that, my dear? Asked Milady. I heard it from the mouth of the messenger himself. Come and sit close to me, said Milady, and let me be assured that no one can hear us. Why do you take all these precautions? You shall know. Milady arose, went to the door, opened it, looked in the corridor, and then returned and seated herself close to Madame Bonachot. Then said she, he has well played his part. Who has? He who just now presented himself to the abbess as a messenger from the cardinal. That was then a part he was playing. Yes, my dear, that man that was not. That man, said Milady, lowering her voice, is my brother. Your brother, said Madame Bonachot. No one must know this secret, my dear, but yourself, if you reveal it to anyone, however, I shall be lost, and perhaps you, likewise. Oh, good God, listen to me, this is what has happened. My brother was coming to my assistance to take me away by force if it were necessary, met with the emissary of the cardinal, who was coming in search of me. He followed him, and arrived at a solitary and retired part of the wood. He drew his sword and required the messenger to deliver up to him the papers of which he was the bearer. The messenger resisted. My brother killed him. Oh, said Madame Bonachot with a shudder. Remember, that was the only means. Then my brother determined to substitute cunning for force. He took the papers and presented himself here as the emissary of the cardinal. And in an hour or two, a carriage will come to take me away by the orders of his eminence. I understand your brother sends this carriage. Exactly so. But that is not all. That letter you have received in which you believe to be from Madame de Chavreuse. Well, it is a forgery. How can that be? Yes, a forgery. It is a snare to prevent your making any resistance when the person comes to fetch you. But it is D'Artagnan that will come. Do not deceive yourself. D'Artagnan and his friends are detained at the siege of La Rochelle. How do you know that? My brother met some emissaries of the cardinal in uniform, in the uniform of musketeers. Nothing 
more easy, we will send my brother's servant back to Bethune, and as I told you, we can trust him. He shall assume a disguise and place himself in front of the convent. If the emissaries of the cardinal arrive, he will take no notice. If they are Monsieur d'Artagnan and his friends, he will bring them to us. He knows them then. Doubtless he does. Has he not seen Monsieur d'Artagnan in my house? Oh, yes, yes, you're right. In this way, all may go well. All may be for the best, but do not go far from this place. The seven or eight leagues at most. We will keep on the frontiers, for instance, and at the first alarm, we can leave France. And what can we do there? Wait. But if they come, my brother's carriage will be here first. If I should happen to be at any distance from you when the carriage comes for you, at dinner or supper, for instance, do one thing. What's that? Tell your good superior that in order that we may be as much together as possible, you beg her to allow you to take your meals with me. Will she permit it? What inconvenience can it be to her? Oh, delightful. In this way we shall not be separated for an instant. Well, go down to her then to make your request. I feel my head a little confused. I will take a turn in the garden, too, and where shall I find you? Here, within an hour. Here, in an hour, both. Oh, you are so kind, and I am so grateful. How can I avoid interesting myself for one who is so beautiful and so amiable? Besides, are you not the beloved of one of my best friends? Oh, dear, 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 dear. Oh, well, you will thank you. I hope so now. Then, well, it's agreed. Let us go down. You are going into the garden. Yes, go along the corridor, down a little staircase, and you are in it. That will do. Thank you. And the two women parted, exchanging affectionate smiles. Uh, lady had told the truth. Her head was confused, for ill-arranged plans clashed against each other like a chaos. She required to be alone in order to bring her thoughts into a little order. She saw vaguely into futurity, but she stood in need of a little silence and quiet to give her all the ideas at present in confusion a distinct form and a regular plan. What was most pressing was to get Madame Bonachot away and convey her to a place of safety, of safety and there matters to so falling out can make her hostage. A lady began to have doubts of the issue of this terrible tool in which her enemies showed as much perseverance as she did in uh, inveterate animosity. Besides, she felt as we feel when a storm is coming on, that this issue was near and could not fail to be terrible. The principal thing for her then was, as we have said, to keep Madame Bonachot in her power. Madame Bonachot was the very life of dear Tag, and more than his life was the life of that woman he loved. This was, in case of ill fortune, a means of treating and obtaining good conditions. Now this point was settled, Madame Bonachot, without any suspicion, accompanied her and once concealed with her at a um, it would be easy to make her believe that D'Artagnan was not to come to Bethune. In a fortnight at most, Rochefort would be back again. During that fortnight, Albert decides that she could have time to think how she could best be revenged upon the four friends. She entertained no fear of being dull, thank God. For she should enjoy the sweetest pastime events could offer to a woman of her character. The perfecting of a cruel. Revolving all this in her mind, she cast her eyes around her and arranged the topography of the garden in her head. The lady was like a good general who contemplates at the same time victory and defeat and who is quite prepared, according to the chances of the battle, to march forward or defeat a retreat. At the end of an hour, she heard a soft voice calling her. It was Madame Bonachot's. The good abbess had naturally consented to her request, and as a commencement, they were to sup together. On reaching the courtyard, they heard the noise of a carriage which stopped at the gate. The lady listened. Do you hear anything? said she. Yes, the rolling of a carriage. It is the one my brother sends for us. Oh, my God. Come, come, courage. A bell of the convent gate was rung. The lady was not mistaken. Go up to your chamber, said she, to Madame Bonachot. You have perhaps some jewels you would like to take with you. I have his letters, said she. Well, go and fetch them and come to my apartment. Uh, snatch the, some supper. We shall perhaps travel part of the night and must keep our strength up. Great God, said Madame Bonacha, placing her hand upon her bosom. My heart beats, so I cannot walk. Courage, my dear courage. Remember that in a quarter of an hour you will be safe and think that what you're about to do is for his sake. Yes, yes, everything for his sake. You have restored my courage by a single word. Go up, I will be with you directly. Milady ran up to her 
apartment quickly and she there found Rochefort Slack. He
not the way I wish it to avenge myself, said my lady, replacing the glass upon the table with an infernal smile. But, my fault. Well, can we do? We do what we can. And she rushed out of the room, and upon a Shazar go out without being able to follow her. She was like those people who dream they are pursued and in vain endeavor to walk. A few moments passed, a great noise was heard in the gate. Every instant, Madame Bonachot expected to see my lady, but she did not return. Several times with terror, no doubt, cold sweat burst from her uh, burning brow. At length, she heard the the grating of the hinges on the opening gates. Several times with terror, no doubt, the cold sweat burst from her burning brow. At length she heard the, gre the grating of the hinges of the opening gates. The noise of boots and spurs resounded on the stairs. There was a great murmur of voices which continued to draw near, and among which it appeared to her she heard her own name pronounced. All at once she uttered a loud cry of joy of D'Artagnan. D'Artagnan, D'Artagnan, right? She is it you. This way, this way. Constance, Constance, replied the young man. Where are you? Where are you? At the same moment, the door of a cell, of the cell, yielded to a shock. Rather than was opened, several men rushed into the chamber. Madame Monashu had sunk into a hotel without the power of moving. D'Artagnan threw a yet smoking pistol from his hand and fell on his knees before his mistress. Athos replaced it, his and his belt. Porthos and Aramis, who held their drawn swords in their hands, returned them to their scabbards. Oh, D'Artagnan, my beloved, dear D'Artagnan, thou art come, then at least thou hast not deceived me. It is indeed thee. Yes, yes, dear Constance, uh, you added at last. Oh, it was in vain. She told me you would not come. I hoped silently. I was not willing to fly. Oh, how rightly I have done. How happy I am. At this word, she who had seated himself quietly started up. She, but she, asked to your Titan, why my companion, though from friendship for me, wished to take me from my persecutors. She, who was taking you for the cardinal's guards, had just fled away. Your companion, cried your Titan, becoming more pale within this white veil of his mistress. Of what companion are you speaking, dear Constance? Of her whose carriage was at the gate of a woman who calls herself your friend, of a woman to whom you have told everything. But her name, her name, right here, Dagon, my God, can you not remember her name? Yes, it was pronounced before me once. Stop, but it is very strange. Oh, my God, my head swims. I cannot see. Help, help, my friends. Her hands are icy cold. Right here, Dagon, she will faint. Great God, she's losing her senses. Ah, uh, what this was calling for help. With all the power of his strong voice, Aramis ran to the table to get a glass of water. But he stopped at seeing the horrible alteration that had taken place in the countenance of Athos, who, standing before the table, his hair raising from his head, his eyes fixed in stupor, was looking at one of the glasses and appeared a prey to the most horrible doubt. Oh, said Athos, oh no, is it, impos it is impossible. God would not permit such a crime. Water, water, cried your dad. Oh, Aramis.
transport those call for help useless city those useless for the poison which she pours out there is no count there is no counter poison oh yes yes help the crop armor madam bonacho help then collecting all the strength she took the head of the young man between her hands looked at him for an instant as if her old soul passed in that look with a sobbing cry past her lips to his constance a sigh escaped from the mouth of madame bonacho had dwelt for an instant on the of dear Dagnan, that sigh was the soul so chaste and so loving, reascending to heaven. Dear Dagnan held nothing but a corpse pressed in his arms. The young man uttered a cry and fell by the side of his mistress, as pale and as senseless as she was. For thus wept Aramis pointed toward heaven. He thus made the sign of, a cross, of the cross. At that moment, a man appeared in the doorway, almost as pale as those in the chamber. Looked round him and saw Madame Bonacho dead, and dear Dagnan fainting. He appeared just at that moment of stupor which follows great catastrophes. I was not deceived, said he. His mon yours, Monsieur D'Artagnan, and yours, friends, Messieurs Athos, Porthos, and Aramis. The persons whose names were the pronounced looked at the stranger with astonishment. All three thought they knew him. Gentlemen, resumed the newcomer, you are as I am in search of a woman who had at with a terrible smile. To pass this way for a sea of corpse. The three friends remained mute, for although the voice as well as the countenance reminded them of someone they had seen, they could not remember under what circumstances. Gentlemen, continued the stranger, since you do uh, not recognize a man who probably uh, owes his life to you twice, I must name myself. I am the Lord de Winter, brother in law of that woman. The three friends uttered a cry of surprise. Athos rose and offered him his hand. You are welcome, my lord, said he. You are one of us. I set out five hours after her. Reports must have Lord Winter. I arrived three hours after her. At the moment, I missed her by twenty minutes at St. Omer. At last, in later years, I lost all trace of her. I was going about a hazard inquiring of everybody when I saw you gal past. I recognized my All your diligence you have arrived too late. You see, said me this pointing to Madame Bonacho, dead, and to dear Dagnan and Porthos and Aramis who are endeavoring to recall to life. Are they then both dead? said de Winter sternly. No, but he thus fortunately more certain not so dear Dagnan has only fainted. Oh, I'm glad to hear that, said Lord de Winter. At that moment dear Dagnan opened his eyes. He tore himself from the arms of Porthos and Aramis and threw himself like a madman of his mistress, Athos rose, walked toward his friend with a slow and solemn step, and embraced him tenderly, and as he burst into violent sobs, he said to him, with his noble and persuasive voice, Friend, to be a man, a man for the dead, and avenge them. Oh, yes, cried D'Artagnan, yes, if it be to avenge her, I am ready to follow you. Athos took advantage of this moment of strength, which the hope of vengeance restored to his unfortunate friend, to make a sign to Porthos and Aramis to go and fetch the in the corridor in great trouble and agitation at such strange events. She called for some of the nuns who, against all rules, found themselves in the presence of five men. Madame said, Athos, passing his arm under that of D'Artagnan, we abandoned to your pious care the body of that unfortunate woman. She was an angel on earth before, being an angel in heaven. Trust, treat her as one of your sisters. We will return some day to pray over her grave. D'Artagnan concealed his face in the bosom of Athos and sobbed said Athos, weep. Thou poor heart, full of love, youth and life, alas, would that I were able to weep as thou long, as thou dost. And he drew away his friend, affectionate as a father, consoling his priest, great as a man, but suffered much. All five, followed by their lackey, meaning their horses, took away to the town of Bethune, whose faborg they had received and stopped before the first auberge they came to. But, said D'Artagnan, shall we not pursue that woman? Presently, said Athos, I have measurement measures to take. She will escape us, replied the young man. She will escape us, and it will be your fault, Athos. I will be accountable for her, said Athos. D'Artagnan had so much confidence in the word of his friend that he hung down his head and entered the auberge without making a reply. 
or the scenario must look at each other without comprehending one's ethos derived this assurance. Lord de Winter believed he spoke in this manner to soothe the grief of the Artagnan. Now, gentlemen, said Athos, when we had ascertained that there were five chamber chambers disengaged in the hotel, let everyone retire to his own apartment. D'Artagnan requires to be alone to weep and to sleep. I take charge of everything, be all of you at ease. It appears, however, said Lord de Winter, that if there be any measures to be taken against the Countess, it is particularly concerns me. She is my sister-in-law, and I, said Athos, she is my wife. D'Artagnan smiled. Satisfied, Athos was sure of his vengeance. When he revealed such a secret as that, Arthur and Hermes looked at each other and changed color. Lord de Winter thought Athos was mad. Now all retire to your chambers, said Athos, and leave me to act. You must perceive that in my quality of husband, this concerns me in particular. Only D'Artagnan, if you have not lost it, give me the piece of paper which fell from that man's hat upon which it is written. The name of the village of Ah, said dear Titan, I comprehend now that name written in her hand. You see then, said Athos, there is a God in heaven still. Whatever it is, wherever you are.